Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeu. My guest on this very special edition of the Chronicles of Aguna is Simon Collings of the Evening Standard. Simon, welcome to the show, mate. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure is all ours. Pleasure is all ours. Uh, but Simon, it's not been a great weekend from an Arsenal perspective. What is your assessment of Arsenal season so far? Um, yeah, I mean, that Brighton game was probably, you know, a good a good match, which which typifies what, what the season's been like for Arsenal, where, um, you know, Aubameyang or Lacazette have, have turned up, delivered the goods, looked good going forward. But defensively, we're seeing the same difficulties, the same problems that the club had in, you know, the final seasons of Arsene Wenger, where... You know they leak goals. Um, they they can't seem to you know have the defensive solidity that a team that wants to finish in the top four can have. And I think that's why they're, they're going to miss out on on finishing in the top four. It's obviously the Europa League, which means they can get Champions League football. But I think we've seen over the course of this season that undoubtedly Arsenal have got an attack which is, I think any team in the league would 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 want any of their attackers, and it's probably you know, on its day, one of the best in Europe, but they've got a defence that is is not good enough. And until those issues are addressed and fans will obviously have their opinions on, on who should go and who should stay, then I think they're still going to struggle to get in that top four. So I think the Brighton game was perhaps, you know, the, the final realisation that, that some things need to change, I think. Absolutely. I mean, what have you made of Unai Emery and the job he's done so far? Those who listen to the show on a regular basis will know that, I'm yet to be convinced that he is the man to take Arsenal forward. But how do you see it? How do you assess his performance as a manager so far? Uh, it's a difficult one because I think there have been you know, moments where you've felt like he's cracked it. I mean, certainly, I think back to the Manchester United game, some of those performances against Tottenham, even that Napoli away game where you know Arsenal was, was so disciplined and went there and won 1-0. You, you, you felt like, oh, you know, he's got it right here. And the frustration for me is the thing that we we lauded him for at the start was you know his his tactical flexibility, his ability to change you know in game formation. He would change players, the substitutions. You know towards the end of that Wenger reign, you sort of know around sixty seventy minutes, player X is coming off and player Y is coming on. And with, with Emery, yeah. we haven't had that. You know we saw half time substitutions. We saw you know back three going and then you know midway in the game he'd go to a back four. But I kind of feel like towards the end of this season, you know, I'm I'm often of the opinion that once you get to these sort of you know final eight, ten games, Alex Ferguson was the sort of best at it. You know, you stop the rotation, you stop the changing, you play your best team, and you just you just go for it. And I kind of feel perhaps his tweaks have been the downfall when they were so good at the start. Um, but overall, you know, for me, I, I still think he, he definitely deserves another season. In my opinion, I think we all knew that the, the squad needed major surgery. He's done some of that, but I think you've got to give him another chance at, at you know, cracking that top four. And if we were sat in, in August talking in, in, you know, September at the start of the season, we'd have probably said, where do we think this team finishes? I think most people would have said par would have been sort of fifth place, finishing above fifth place, would have been overachieving. So I think if he finishes fifth and he wins Europa League, that's a fantastic season. But even if he finished fifth and, and didn't win Europa League, I think for me, he needs another year to get his ideas across and another one, two windows to, to change that squad because th- there have been enough signs of promise for me to think, you know, he deserves another chance. But I, I agree with you that the, the jury is still out, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, for me, the jury's still out. For me, I, I've seen some signs of improvement, but I've also seen certain areas where we haven't improved. And I've been very vocal about it this season and I've taken an absolute bashing uh, from some of our supporters <laughs> for, for having that opinion. At the end of the day, it is just an opinion. But... When you're looking at sort of, the, and people always say this, you know, Unai Emery needs a, a couple more transfer windows. The, from where I'm standing, though, it doesn't look like he's going to get the backing that he needs in terms of the finances that are required to turn this squad around. So would you not agree that maybe we need to, well, not we need to look for someone else, but Unai Emery needs to find a way of getting more out of what he does have? Because the reality is he's not going to be able to bring in 11 players in the summer, is he? Yeah, and I, th- I think well, the, the difficult situation is I think if they get that Champions League football, I think this this forty million pound budget that we know about could change, could go up. 
Um, but otherwise not. I think it's going to be a big case of, like you say, either getting more out of what he's got or, you know, if, if he can shift players that he doesn't particularly like. And I think, you know, someone who falls into that, that category is, is Henrik Mkhitaryan, who we haven't really seen this season. Um, he hasn't been a regular for Emery. You know, El Nene's another player in that bracket you probably add in. Mustafi, if he can get these players off the wage and get money in, then he can perhaps change the squad. But otherwise, as you say, I think it's going to be about Emery coaching these players. And to be fair, I, I think that was a big attraction. You know, we heard about this big process where Gazidis was, was talking to the, the incoming managers. And the thing they liked about Emery was the fact that he knew all the squad. You know, he knew the young players. He knew the academy players, what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were. So I think the, the Arsenal board are in their right to say, look, you know, you had this extensive knowledge of this squad you know, make it better, improve it and coach it. But there, there needs to be, you know, a bit of give for him to, to try and get, get players in. And for me, from, from the outside looking in, the hope would be he can get rid of, you know, four, five, six players, you know, that could maybe double that budget from 40 to 80 million. And then you're looking at if you get, you know, three three good players in, it, it can change the face of the squad. But it's going to be a, a very difficult summer for Emery if, if that budget is, is as low as, as the rumours say it is. I mean, where have these rumours come from, Simon? Because, you know, I've I've seen them everywhere. Every time I sort of tweet or comment about it, I get a load of people coming at me saying, actually, we don't know that. Has this come from a credible sources or is it just hearsay to your knowledge? It seems to be pretty, you know, pretty strongly reported by, you know, people who know the club very well. I mean, James Olley, my colleague who covers Arsenal extensively, David Ornstein seems to say it as the same as that. And the, the difference always was in the past, you know, when before Kroenke t- took his majority stake, that we had, you know, we had the um, the AGM, we'd be able to see the accounts. So people could work out how much money was really there. It's different now because obviously we don't have these accounts being published. We don't, it's a private company now. You know, we don't know how much the club have to spend. So journalists are always being briefed by this, by people at the club, but it's very much a fluid thing. And I think, you know, the people who have reported strongly do add that, you know, if players go, that's more money for them to spend. If they qualify for the Champions League, that's more money. But it, it seems pretty credible from from people who follow the club, you know, very closely, that 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 is the amount. So, and, and I think for Emery, that that will be perhaps a shock that it's that amount of money. But it's still, you know, if you can sell players, which the board will think they can, it, it can be a budget which can strengthen the team. Is it so much about selling though, or is it more about just as in in terms of getting transfer fees in, or is it more about? The wage bill, because that's been, you know, well documented this season that we've got a problem there. Uh, for me, I always think that people talk about Mesut Ozil's wages far too much, in my opinion. I think the the real issues is the likes of Henrik Mkhitaryan, as you've mentioned, someone like Stefan Licksteiner, who's on a pretty hefty amount. It's about getting rid of numbers, isn't it, to, to bring that wage bit budget down. And then, you know, I think that's more important than actually getting transfer fees in for outgoing players. Would you agree? Yeah, well, I think wages is perhaps, you know, I'm thinking back to sort of 10, maybe 15 years ago. The big thing when we always spoke about transfers, you know, you think of the, when Brambich came in and Chelsea and suddenly clubs started spending crazy money. It was all about the transfers, the transfers. And wages for me now is the big thing with Premier League clubs. I mean, if you look further down the table somewhere and someone like Crystal Palace, you know, 75% of their turnover is spent on wages. You know, wow. huge amounts of money. And, and, and Arsenal, you know, spend big on wages and, the Premier League are trying to combat it. So they have sort of regulations now where your wage bill can only go up by a certain percentage each year. But it can, if you get more commercial money in or different streams of revenue, it can go up. But they're trying to sort of stop this, you know, huge inflation in wages. And Arsenal are no different. You know, Mesut Ozil, by going on £350,000 a week, we saw it with Aaron Ram. You know, other players in the squad are going to be like, well, I shouldn't be £150,000 part of I should maybe be, you know, 60, 70. But we've, we've already seen them addressing that wage bill, I think. The fact that Petr Cech will go, um, the fact that Aaron Ramsey's obviously going, the fact that Danny Welbeck's also gone. You know, you look at there, you know, the best part of three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand pounds £400,000. And if you get rid of someone like Mkhitaryan again, it provides more structures. So I think you are very much right. And it's the same for all clubs in the Premier League. It's, it's about the wage bill and how you control it. And as much as we, you know, moan about Tottenham and people don't like talking about Tottenham, they are one club who, at the moment, are getting away with having a wage bill where you know it's it's quite a, a smaller basic play compared to other clubs, but then highly incentivised contracts. So that is the the difficulty for Arsenal is to try and keep that wage bill down. And um, if someone like Licksteiner was to go as well, again, you've got more money there. So 
it's a difficult one for clubs because everyone is paying more wages. So I can see why Arsenal did a big deal like Ozil because if you don't do it, you're going to get left behind. But but now it's about balancing it and, and keeping it in check. Exactly. And I mean, let's be realistic. Nobody was complaining about Ozil's wages at the time. Everyone was just thankful that having seen what was happening with Alexis Sanchez, that we managed to tie him down. So I guess it's kind of a little bit unfair to now turn on there. Plus, Mesut Ozil is a huge brand, isn't he? He is a phenomenal brand. I mean, I think I, I had a look and he's got more social media followers than Arsenal Football Club itself. So he's obviously a big brand. He obviously has some value because, let's face it, we've got an ownership and a board at the moment that aren't really willing to spend beyond their means. So if this wasn't worth their while in terms of the revenue, I don't think they would have done it, which is the first thing to think about. But... I mean, you know, how do you see us getting on against Valencia? I mean, the first leg, the performance was good at times. Um, I think that third goal was vital, in my opinion. But how did you uh, see us against them? And how do you see the second leg going? Yeah, I think you're absolutely spot on with that with that third goal. Um, you know, I sat next, sat next to my colleague. And, and when it went in, you know, we both turned to each other and said that completely changes the entire tie. Because going there 2-1, you're a bit sort of, you know, it's, it's not a great result for a side like Arsenal who we know, you know, struggle away from home. But I think that third goal completely changes it. And and what we saw from from that night was, you know, I think in the, the start of the game was almost a bit of a hangover from those three defeats they'd had on the spin where it just looked lacking in confidence. And then Valencia got that goal. And, and I was impressed by the, the fact that the, the team got back and, and rallied so well. But we also saw that as much as, you know, Arsenal aren't great in defence. I'm not a big, I'm not a big believer in Valencia having the strongest defence I've seen, certainly in the Europa League. And I think Arsenal will know they can go there and score a goal. They will know if Aubameyang and Lacazette are playing, you would fancy them to go there and score a goal against that defence. And as, as soon as they score, it changes the game where Valencia need four goals. Um, and so I think that that third goal really did turn the tie and and puts the pressure, you know, firmly on Valencia to to try and come out the blocks and try and attack Arsenal, and, and that will suit them. So. I, I, they're in pole position to to qualify for the final, and, and if they didn't get through, um, you know, I'd be very surprised. I know Emery was going, oh, it's fifty fifty, but you know, for reality, in my opinion, it's more seventy thirty, eighty twenty in Arsenal's favour. Absolutely, absolutely. So, are we going to go on and win the Europa League? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I, I mean, this is the interesting one. People are sort of saying, oh, you know, I really don't want Chelsea in in, in the final, but. I was saying to you before we went before we went live that I I saw them play uh, against Watford the other day, um, and in terms of you know man for man, I don't think they are a much better team than Arsenal. Um, but the difference you know with Chelsea is Eden Hazard, and and that Absolutely. would be my concern about playing them in a final. You know, if, if Hazard turns up in what most likely going to be his last ever game for Chelsea, it's going to be incredibly difficult to stop him. But I, I would. You know, particularly fancy Arsenal in a one-off game at a neutral stadium against Chelsea by by all means to go and do a job. And Kante's picked up an injury, which could be a blow for them. So I think the dream for Arsenal would be Frankfurt pulling off some surprise result and, and getting to the final. But I, I would not have any hesitations about Arsenal, you know, beating Chelsea. And particularly as Unai Emery, we know in this competition and we know in big finals that he can deliver. So... Um, it's, it's obviously their last chance for Luna as well for the top for finishing the Champions League. So um, I think there's no reason why they can't go and, go and win the Europa League. Fingers crossed you're right, mate. Fingers crossed you're right. Simon, thank you very much for joining me. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can find you on social media and keep up with the fantastic work that you do? Yeah, so I'm on uh, Twitter at, at SR and then underscore Colling, C-O-L-L-I-N-G-S. So yes, feel free to... Give me a, vent your abuse to me on there, so I'll, I'll try and reply. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, we hope to speak to you again in the very near future. Thank you very much.